Good evening, welcome. This is Kelly Henderson with Forum Families Forward, and we are really pleased to welcome you tonight to our second in a series uh, on FASD diagnosis. Uh, and we have Dr. Renee Turchi uh, from St. Christopher's Hospital in Philadelphia, and she is gonna take over in just a moment, but I wanted to do a little bit of housekeeping to get us situated for the evening. Um, we are using a platform called GoToWeb GoToWebinar, which may be new to some folks. Uh, and we are uh, going to show you a little bit of uh, functionality using your pods that are there probably on the right of your screen. If you aren't seeing those, there might be an orange box with an arrow and you can pop that box out or you can push that box back in if with that orange arrow. We are going to encourage you to use the questions pod for your comments and questions. Dr. Turchi has a lot of great information. We are setting aside time at the end for questions. Um, and Lisa, Mathy, and I will, um, at Forum Families Forward, help to coordinate uh, the questions and organize those questions and group them uh, by topic. Uh, so if you use the questions pod to uh, put your comments and questions in, we will, we will make sure that Dr. Turchi is able to address those. Uh, if you need a certificate of attendance, you can email us after the session at info at formedfamiliesforward.org. If you are watching this in recording, you can also do the same. We can tell whether you have viewed the recording. Uh, and so again, info at formedfamiliesforward.org. Uh, we will um, also hopefully before the evening is out, be able to populate the pod that says handouts with Dr. Turchi's slides. So we will we assure you now, that one way or the other, we will get you a copy of the slides. Um, so uh, Dr. Church is working on that right now to get us uh, the ability to share those in the handouts pod. And we will let you know when they are there. Worst case, we will email them to you after the session and put them on our website for your reference. Uh, so don't worry, you will be able to get a copy of those slides. Foreign Families Forward, very briefly, is a a parent uh, and caregiver resource center in Northern Virginia. We focus largely on foster, adoptive, and kinship families who are raising children, youth, and young adults with special needs. We also serve the professionals who work with our families and partner with us to serve um, all of our kiddos. Uh, we do our work through free trainings like this. Um, we have consultations, educational consultations to families. Those are fairly in-depth and they are free of charge. Contact us if you need anything in that arena. Uh, we have events, we have classes, we have systems navigation. We can help you navigate the systems here in Northern Virginia that are designed to support families with uh, children with special needs. We have some support groups I'm gonna talk about a little bit later. We do webinars, uh, we have videos, all kinds of resources. We also so are, if you're an educator, you may know or be familiar with the Virginia Tiered Systems of Support, and we are the family partner to that project. My email there is at the bottom, Kelly Henderson. I am um, proud and pleased and honored to direct Formed Families Forward. Lisa Mathy, our training and administrative coordinator, is with us, and her email is there as well. You are welcome and encouraged to contact us after the webinar if you need anything. A couple upcoming events, including one tomorrow. Um, as, as 2022 has come on, we had expected, I think, um, uh, a much smoother transition to a new year, uh, but the pandemic has, has not done with us. So there's, there's lots of reason to really think about our self-care as, um, as we are parents and caregivers and doing our day in, day out uh, duties. Uh, so take a moment tomorrow at lunchtime and join Dr. Uh, Monique Liliakos, who is a kinship expert and a um, social worker by training. And she's gonna talk us through some wonderful wonderful self-care strategies for our new year. Uh, I mentioned that we have peer support groups. Lisa, I think, is furiously putting um, putting links in the chat box, so please feel free to, to use that chat box um, and pull those links. We have a wonderful option for an in-person support group for our youth and young adults ages 14 to 22. That is twice a month in person in Fairfax. We use all kinds of safety precautions uh, to ensure everyone's health and safety, uh, but those are free of charge and it's a really great opportunity if you are raising children um, in that age range that could benefit from, from peer support. They are led by clinicians. Uh, we have support groups for adoptive and foster parents and kinship caregivers, and those are offered vir both virtually and in person, uh, Sundays and Wednesdays, uh, first Sunday of the month or the third 
Wednesday for the in-person. Um, and again, the link there is for you to learn more about those support groups. Um, and finally, this is the second, as I mentioned, of our FASD series. Uh, last week, we had Melissa El Ellickson uh, from the FACETS group, the nonprofit, and talked a lot about the neurobehavioral approach to um, addressing uh, children, youth, and young adults who have uh, prenatal exposure to alcohol. And so she really offered some wonderful context for our whole series, but she also offered some um, really practical strategies. So take a look at that. That is That recording is on our website, formedfamiliesforward.org. Tonight, again, we're thrilled to have Dr. Turchi. I'm gonna let her introduce herself in just a moment, addressing that really sticky, sticky wicket of diagnosis of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders or all of the disorders that may fall within that umbrella. Next week, we have Dr. Molly Malayans from Emory University talking about educational interventions. And then the week after that, I will uh, wrap up our series with talking about what uh, FASD might look like and could look like in schools and things that educators may um, want to know about and what families can help educators learn about um, in serving their children. Okay, and we're going to turn it back over to Dr. Turchi. I'm going to give her the screen share. Thank you. And what, and um, Dr. Turchi, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's truly an honor here to be with all of you this evening. Thanks for sharing your Thursday evening with me. Um, <clears throat> uh, Lisa and Kelly, just FYI, what I did, because I wanted to make sure my slides were up. If it's okay with you, I emailed you both uh, my slides as well as a handout of an article that I thought folks might really want to have. Are you able to help me in putting those in the chat as I get started on my talk? Is that okay? Can you hear um, me? Yeah, Renee, I you I couldn't quite hear you because my internet went out at the moment, but I please it's not in your head, so I know she's on top of whatever you ask her to do. Okay, okay, <laughs> we will okay. make it happen. I, you guys. I just wanted to make sure I got started with my talk, but if you guys could enter in the chat, I didn't want to um yes. I just want to make sure we could get moving. And I um just want to say again, what an honor to be here with all of you. Thank you for um allowing me to come and be part of this this community. Um, my name is Renee Turchi. I am a pediatrician. Um, I practice out in Philadelphia and uh, I've been a pediatrician for 21 years. Um, I will tell you, um, I'm also a mother of two children. And um, I'll tell you, I, I, in introducing myself, I think one of the things that's probably most relevant to this discussion tonight is um, how I became sort of interested in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. I was a medical student and trained back in the late 90s. And when I trained in um, pediatrics, we were taught back in those days that um, about fetal alcohol syndrome, so that kids either had fetal alcohol syndrome or they did it, very similar to Down syndrome. You sort of had it or you didn't. And I remember um, when I was, you know, I went through my training and I was a practicing doctor for about five to six years. And I was at a um, talk at the uh, Pennsylvania Department of Health and there was a gentleman there named Dan Dubowski who was giving a talk and he started talking about, and it's the first time I ever heard the phrase fetal alcohol spectrum disorders. And I very distinctly remember sitting there and hearing about FASD and thinking, oh my gosh, like I probably had so many patients over the last couple of years and missed them because of sort of the, you know, training that I had a number of years ago. And I became sort of just really intrigued and motivated to learn more. Um, and uh, as a pediatrician, I do complex care. So I take care, I do primary care uh, for children with special health care needs. I just had a, a wonderful uh, day of patients uh, today. And, you know, I um, really felt like for our practice as a medical home for children with special health care needs that learning about FASD was important. And um, over the years, I had lots of mentoring. I don't claim to be omniscient here, but I'm here tonight to share some of my knowledge and um, what we've developed over the years, we had a series of grants, but we developed a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder program, a screening and diagnostic program. So I'm here to share a little bit about that with you tonight. So again, thank you for having me um, with all of you. Um, I have no disclosures um, to make. Um, so I'm here. Uh, and essentially what I was hoping um, to accomplish um, this evening really was to give you, you know, an overview of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders and some of the diagnostic criteria used and talk a little bit about screening and why that's important. 
Um, and really, when you think about diagnosis, understand some of those physical and behavioral characteristics of um, for children with an FASD. Talk a little bit about the referrals and what's near and dear to my heart, uh, the role of the medical home. And also just really have fun and learn. Um, anyone who knows me and uh, when I do my, my patient care, I always have music. I like to have fun and I think we all need to smile. Um, you know, it's a rough time in the world right now. We're all doing the best we can um, with COVID. I never thought years ago we'd be where we are. So I can appreciate that all of you are here trying to learn about a, um, a topic that I'm passionate about and um you know uh and giving up some time so i hope that we can i hope you learn something useful um i'll try to highlight some some big picture things um but please uh, we're going to do questions at the end um so please write down questions and um and uh just i'm ha happy to be here so when we think about fasd one of the things that really is so compelling and, and was compelling to me is you know these these numbers. So when you think about, um, we always talk about prevalence, which is you know, how common is something um, at a point in time in a population. I put these numbers here. I want you guys to have you know some data, but you know even the the recent numbers. You know if you talk about fetal alcohol syndrome and fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, which I'll define in a minute, um, we know that FASD, um, and we're discovering and know that they're extraordinarily more pre prevalent than previously thought. Um, there's been a lot of studies. Um, Dr. May is uh, someone who's very well known in this arena. Um, and, you know, we, there's, they've done things in, in the U.S. and other, other countries, but, um, you know, they've also looked at um, children in the child welfare system. But really, um, you know, when you look at some of these numbers here, you know, and talking about anywhere from, you know, 6% of children with the syndrome and up to 17 um, percent um, of children um, in child welfare, um, up to 5% uh, for children in a city. You know, these are numbers, and I share these with you, not to get so much, much caught up in the numbers, but to really when, you know, say to me, you know, how does this compare to other diagnoses, right? So I'm showing you all these numbers, and you might say, well, what is, you know, what, what you know, there's a lot to, to think about when you're looking at, um, at, at, when we do this in medicine, you know, how does this, this seems awfully high. I and mean, when you're talking about things like, you know, one in, you know, you know, how, when we start talking about you, you have a room full of a hundred kids and you're talking about, um, you know, five to 10 kids that might have a fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, that's significant. And that should raise the awareness of families, of practitioners, of agencies. And, you know, a lot of what those of us that do that advocate for FASD, you know, it's not that you really want to be in competition with other diagnosis, but a lot of times we'll look at, you know, other diagnoses to sort of say, you know, here, here we are um, in these recent estimates where, you know, if you look at how FASDs, you know, compared to things like autism, whether, which is a condition that has increased interest and awareness, um, and look at, you know, even having the fetal alcohol syndrome at six to nine per thousand kids or an FASD, anywhere from 24 to almost 50, they're two to four times more prevalent than autism. And yet, really, the discrepancy in advocacy and resources devoted to FASD is not nearly there. So I share this with you just to kind of get you jazzed up to say, you know, this is important and we should care. And it's part of the reason why um, I think, you know, this group and, um, you know, the, the Formed Families Forward is, it has this talk and is doing this series. but it's just, you know, I really want you to come away knowing that this is very common um, and very prevalent. And so, you know, why why is this, you know, this, this exposure? Why is this, you know, so relevant? Why are we, you know, I'm showing you that it's prevalent, it's the numbers are high. But one of the reasons when I think about its relevance to public health, to maternal child health, you know, it's it's one of the most common preventable causes of intellectual disability and behavior problems that I'd see in, in pediatric practice. And also those effects can be lifelong. So it's preventable and it doesn't go away, so it's lifelong. And it really, that effect of alcohol um, on development and function is actually more so than many other drugs and strategies that we see. 
And it often surprises people that the effects of alcohol are greater than, you know, what we're seeing now with like the opioid epidemic. And, um, you know, it's, you know, important to remember that behind tobacco, alcohol is the most common substance to be used with other drugs or in pregnancy. And so when we think about all the things that, you know, can happen to children, it's important to remember that it's preventable and it's lifelong. And, you know, I think because alcohol is a legal substance, sometimes it doesn't get, you know, the, um, the play in pregnancy that other drugs might, because you don't get arrested for just drinking alcohol. You know, you get arrested or get in trouble if you're driving drunk, things like that. So one of the things to, to, that I often think about in light of that you know, we got this grant at my practice and we started a number of years ago, our fetal alcohol spectrum disorders program. You know, what I found over time and what I often say is, you know, the bad news is business is good. Meaning that, you know, in an ideal world, if you keep in your heart what I just shared, you know, knowing that this is preventable, if, you know, if, if public health was doing it's what it, it should be doing, it would be a beautiful world if there was no FASD. If women knew not to drink alcohol, if they are pregnant or could become pregnant, you know, this is a preventable illness. It's not like something, you know, that children are born with that we don't know where it comes from or how it happens. So as much as I love and I'm passionate about what I do, I often think about and I'm passionate about the advocacy. It's why I always love to give talks like this, because I often think if I give a talk and whether I'm helping a parent or a youth or I do a lot of talks with the trainees because I think about even women of childbearing age, maybe it's also just helping to educate someone who might be pregnant or becoming pregnant not to drink, then that is success. So it's important, I don't want you to get caught up in this alphabet soup, but I do think it's important, and you'll have my slides, and this is in the article that I shared with you um, that I worked on with Dr. Smith. If you're in this space, you wanna understand these acronyms. You know, in medicine, sometimes I feel like we use this whole other lexicon, this whole other language where we start rattling off, you know, acronyms and you could have a whole conversation and someone might not even know what you're talking about. And in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, there's FASD, there's a lot of that there. And so you'll see things like this fetal alcohol syndrome, you'll, um, you'll see, and that's um, what I had, uh, I'm going to go through each one of these. Um, but this is, um, you know, alcohol related birth defects neurobehavioral disorder associated with prenatal alcohol exposure, partial FAS, alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorder. So I don't want you to get too caught up or worried about these things. I do have a definition slide here kind of going through it. Um, but I think it's important if you are even thinking about this or find yourself there, I want you to have this information um, in your handouts and, and you know at your fingertips. And so this is some of the terminology, I you know, um, the, the PAE, the prenatal alcohol exposure, it's simply alcohol exposure. It doesn't really refer to any effect of that exposure. Um, FASD, which is, you know, is really that umbrella term. That's why I have that icon there. And that really is there, you know, to encompass the diagnoses. It's not um, that are underneath it, those specific diagnoses. It's not really a diagnostic term, but really we sort of think about it as a conceptual term. So um, and then you'll see their fetal alcohol syndrome. That's the most widely known diagnosis in the FASD spectrum. And if you remember what I said earlier, when I was a student, that's kind of what we were taught. You had FAS or you didn't. And I'll show you in a few slides the face and, and how we used to think about it. We still see FAS for sure, but years ago, that's all we knew. We didn't know about this, this whole um, wide spectrum. And then um, the ARND is the alcohol-related neurodevelopmental disorders, and that's really often used for kids who have the like the brain effects of alcohol but you don't see the physical characteristics that i'll show you in a minute kind of the characteristic lip and facies and then when you see on um, the ndpae that's really um this newest term characterizing um the disorder in the fasd spectrum and it's kind of this emerging um diagnosis and it really what's nice about this one is that it kind of hones in on some of those behavioral characteristics um, that are associated with alcohol exposure. So again, not to overwhelm you with acronyms, but I feel like we throw around all these terms and I didn't want you guys to feel lost. So when do we consider an FASD diagnosis? I'll tell you 
you know, if I had a nickel for every time I heard a parent or a caregiver say to me, you know, I was reading a story, I saw a movie, I was talking to another parent and they were describing a child with FASD or I was reading about it. I'm like, oh my God, this is my child. This is my son. Um, and there's some very characteristic things. And so, you know, it's tough because of this umbrella term and sometimes um, it's not alone. It can be in com combination with other diagnoses. So it gets a little confusing, but I do think it's important to kind of think about what are some areas that might make one, whether it's a clinician, a parent, a caregiver, think about an FAC diagnosis. So if you have a developmental cognitive or behavioral concern, um, a lot of complex medical concerns like heart issues, um, feeding issues, um, growth de deficits. It's really interesting with growth deficits. You know, I've seen a lot of kids. I had a, um, a young man that I saw who was 20 and I saw him for the first time. And when we in my diagnostic clinic with the diagnostic criteria that we use, we go way, way, way back and um, we look at growth records. And so um, from the whole childhood. And so sometimes there's growth deficits. It doesn't mean that a child has had issues with growth their whole life. You really have to look at those growth curves from like from way back when they were little. You certainly um, want to think about that maternal alcohol or drug use, which often truly sometimes presents a problem for us in practice. I see many children who are adopted, um, who might have been um, come from an orphanage, sometimes not in the, in the U.S., um, sometimes they're in child welfare, sometimes they are biologic children. Sometimes it's hard to confirm that alcohol diagnosis. Sometimes moms are scared. Sometimes bio moms are scared to disclose that they drank because they're worried they're going to be judged. They're worried someone's going to take their child away. So sometimes when I have seen children, it happened to me last year where I was seeing a child who was in foster care and um, school really wanted us to look at this child to have a diagnosis because they thought that he had an FASD. But you know, part of going back to mom to find out about her alcohol consumption because it wasn't like someone saw her drink or, you know, maybe she wasn't in rehab. You know, talking to mom myself, she was pretty honest about the fact that she wanted to be honest with me, but she was worried about the ramifications. But that history of alcohol exposure is something that's really important for us on the medical side. Sometimes a sibling diagnosed with an FASD can be a really important clue because if a mom has been, you know, struggling or suffering from a alcohol substance use disorder, you know, sometimes a sibling raises the um, their awareness. And I'm going to, on the other thing to consider is some of the characteristic facial features that I'm going to share with you in a minute. So just some things to kind of make you start thinking about that. Now this again is just a slide I want you to have, not to get too caught up in this, but one of the reasons I like this slide is that, you know, as I remember what I said to you earlier is that FASD is brain injury. Alcohol affects the brain. Alcohol affects the brain from day two or three of conception. So sometimes when you hear people say, well, I didn't drink to the very end, or oh, we only drank a lot in the beginning. It really, yes, definitely more is worse, but the brain is developing all through pregnancy and actually after, you know, our brains grow to about age three. So it's important. And one of the reasons, you know, showing these parts of the brain we sh I, what I really want to show you here is just the areas of the brain and what they do. And it all, this slide is really meant to show you the areas of the brain that can be affected by alcohol exposure. And so the main real point here is that FASD is a global brain injury. And so the alcohol can affect all of these areas. And if you kind of look there at what those areas do for us in our brain, it had, makes you start to think about why we see what we see in children with an FASD. So this is a slide that I think is an interesting one, because if you think about the alphabet soup that I just showed you with all the different diagnoses, the FAS, the partial FAS, um, this is a way to kind of think about the diagnostic features of each disorder within that FASD spectrum. I like this one because it's a, a, like a pictorial way to show which features need to be satisfied to apply those different categories included under that umbrella. So the specifics for the number of the characteristics or features that satisfy, satisfy that criteria differ for the available diagnostic schemes. So for example, um, you know, if you look at um, FAS with confirmed exposure, you know, you have to have that confirmed alcohol exposure, you have to have the facial abnormalities, the growth problems, the brain problems, um, you have to have the cognitive impairments, you have to 
kind of have, um, you know, some of those, um, you know, executive, if you think about the brain, some of those executive functionings. So it's, it's really nice. This is a nice graph to have, to kind of walks you through the different um, areas. And we kind of use these things in practice and just a great thing for you to have um, in terms of thinking about the different um, areas of FAS. So kind of then taking a step back and say, well, okay, you're throwing all these terms at us. You know, how do I even know where do you start um, to even screen and know if an FASD is there? How do we start even on this diagnostic pathway? Um, well, we start when thinking about screening. I think it's like anything. You have to kind of, you know, have your team or yourself kind of think about and buy into why even screening and having a diagnosis is important. One of the things that I have found in practice with parents is that having that diagnosis can often be a major relief. A lot of times parents are searching. They're searching for an answer. They're searching, you know, I often call it the onion because sometimes I'll see a child and they may have seen a lot of people before me and I am not claiming to be omniscient. I'm not claiming, I always tell parents, I am not God. I just use as much of my experience as I can and I'm not always right. I make a lot of mistakes, but I'm here to help you. Our mission is the same, is to help you and help this child um, be the best they can be. But oftentimes when I see parents after years, they're exhausted. They've been to a lot of places. They have a lot of diagnoses, this onion, where we're trying to cut through. And it's not to say the other diagnoses are wrong. It's just that sometimes FASD is at the heart. And for many parents, it explains a lot of things. It pulls it together. The other thing we find is that it's really helpful. And why I talk to my team about screening is that it gives us access to evidence-based interventions, avoids unnecessary testing, referrals, and interventions, and also reduces recurrence. So maybe we're getting the mom in for treatment, maybe we're doing some things. So something to think about. So kind of taking that step back, we say, okay, we know we wanna get a diagnosis, we see the value, how do we get launched? I always say we gotta think about and approach alcohol exposure like universal precautions. You should have, you know, retaining a history of routine alcohol exposure, just totally routinely. It should be part of all well child assessments. You, you know, wanna be asking it as part of and addressing any parent concerns. Review the pregnancy history, social histories, family histories. Maybe there's a, a aunt or uncle or a grandparent that might have had an alcohol use disorder get about every potential exposure and you know explain that alcohol is very commonly consumed it's legal and often before pregnancy is recognized so not all women know they're pregnant the day they're pregnant right unless they're maybe doing fertility or getting hormonal checks many women don't find out until they've missed their first period so if that's really the case sometimes women do have are still going out they may have a drink they may be doing things so knowing all this, you might say to me, well, why aren't we routinely screening? And I'll tell you, in, from a pediatrician's perspective, um, what I find is in, insufficient training um, and really not being comfortable with this diagnosis, worried that when you ask a parent about consuming that they're worried about the stigma and we're asked, worried about the stigma, not wanting to make people feel uncomfortable. And this whole mantra of like, don't ask, don't tell, you know, that we want to protect parents. But really the truth is that sometimes having that diagnosis is the gateway to getting the services that the child needs. So it's really, um, you know, really, really helpful um, for us to kind of think about, you know, um, this whole thing about, you know, um, stereotypic views about mothers who might be exposing their baby to alcohol, um, which really could lead to prejudice and, um, stereotypic views about children with an FASD and we really need to kind of unpack that and debunk it because it's not, you know, we're not going to get at the heart and help kids the way we should um, if we aren't screening and getting that buy-in for screening. So it's important for there to be a record review. So like looking at the history, the birth records, as I mentioned, looking at those growth charts, the medical history, the development history. You know, many times I'll talk to parents and they'll talk a little bit about, hey, when Johnny was a baby, he was a very cranky baby, he wasn't eating well. Um, so sometimes it goes back to, you know, looking at a child who might be 10 or 11, but thinking back to what they were like as an infant. Um, also, it really helps to have the psychological testing 
the cognitive and behavioral assessments um, are really useful. I also have found over the years, it's really helpful to have conversations with mothers. Um, NOFAS, OFAS, Mother's Advocacy Group is wonderful. And I know Kathy Mitchell really well and presented with her. She's been a great mentor to me. Um, she's involved in NOFAS. And you know, this is one of the things that comes from there where I really feel like as you're screening this idea of this be gentle, ask questions and listen, stick to the facts, don't judge and avoid stigmatizing language. And also remind parents that you care about her and her child and their family. And also always remember to use you know, first person language. This child is not an FASD. They have an FASD. But I think sometimes in medicine, you know, we sometimes are loose lipped about how we say things and we don't realize the impact. And I think that's an important point to make because it can be very offensive. I had some, um, I'm a cancer survivor and I'll never forget sitting in my room when I was admitted and listening to them round outside. Um, this was, you know, I was in my early thirties, so I'd already been a physician and I will, I, you know, we'd always been taught to, um, use first person language and I heard them refer to me by my diagnosis of cancer. And it was like a slug in the stomach. And it's something that I really emphasize to all the medical students and residents because I'd be on the other side for me um, was really, it was like, whoa, like that's not who I am. I'm a 33 year old mom of two. Um, I'm this, I'm that, I'm not this cancer. So I think that first person language is really important. And those are some of the things that I feel like the patient and family centered care really bring to life for us in terms of who we are and, and what we do and how we can teach clinicians bringing families together so we can learn together is really important and really helpful. Um, when we also talk about screening, one of the things that we often talk about is, you know, and this can, and I always think about families as conduits of information for leaders or agencies. So, you know, giving some of these screening questions you know, kind of saying like, hey, do you guys screen? And if not, here's how here's how you might do it. Um, and I think that's really, really helpful. Um, this idea of not saying, you know, oh my God, you didn't drink, did you? You know, but how often did you kind of normalizing it? You know, um, you know, in the three months before you knew you were pregnant, how many times did you have four more drinks a day? Um, and so sort of just asking it like you would, okay, did you take any medications? Um, no judgment and just moving ahead. Um, again, as you utilize those screening questions and you'll probe a little more. And, you know, I think this idea of using open-ended questions, tell me about your alcohol use three months prior to finding you were pregnant, um, kind of showing that, you know, I think sometimes in trainings or having these discussions, great role plays can be really effective. Um, I have some great movie clips. I was in the interest of time. I cut some of that out, but, um, Ask about partner drinking habits because many times um, that can be a factor um, and provide reassurance that to provide the best care possible, it's important to know all those pregnancy facts. And I think that that is really important. I'll tell you, I had um, a father once who brought my son to me and um, he was worried that his son had an FASD. And as we were talking, you know, I got this sense that there was something he was hiding, but you know, it's often hard because you're meeting someone for the first time and Building rapport can be hard, and I just, you know, sometimes really, you know, um, want to be sensitive to the fact that people might not want to share everything with you on the first visit. Um, and as we were talking more, and I really was able to get to the heart of like why he thought his son had an FASD, it really came down to the fact that he said that this young man's mom had really struggled with drugs. And when she got really on a binge, she would leave and not come back for days. And he actually gave her alcohol because when she drank, she passed out and stayed home. And at least he knew while she was pregnant, if she drank and stayed home, that he could feed her and take care of her and she wasn't on the street, nothing bad would happen to her. So as we were talking a lot, a youngster who ended up going on to have an FASD, it was really important because in this, this father's mind, he was protecting his unborn child and the mother of his child by giving her alcohol. And in his mind, that wasn't as serious as some of the drugs she was using to, you know, inject. And in us delivering that diagnosis, it was so important to me that there was no blame. But he himself also said that he drank a fair amount. And so I've seen that over the years where sometimes, again, it's not about judgment, but just an awareness that um, if those kinds of things are going on. There might be something a little more. Sorry. So I think that um, 
You know, one thing that I just emphasize a lot is, um, as you can tell, I'm a big Kermit the Frog fan, but I think that empathy and sensitivity are really huge. And um, I think that one of the things for me, you know, in hearing from um, parents and families, um, that's a picture of the Capitol Rotunda in Pennsylvania and Harrisburg. And that was one of the first times that I heard, got to hear Kathy uh, Mitchell speak with her daughter, Carly, um, who were really inspirational to me. And um, I do a lot, you know, I'm a pediatrician, so I tend to see people who are younger than 22, 23, but I had not met a young adult with an FAS and um, it was really great. And I felt like that moment in hearing Carly speak and how she forgave her mom for drinking, um, it really was impactful for me because, you know, it also was really impactful to recognize that this diagnosis is challenging because there's a lot of judgment that goes with bio moms, not from me, but from society. And sometimes there's judgment from foster and adoptive parents because they sometimes don't know that, um, you know, that a child has an FASD. And so it's very delicate. And so I think what I come back to is that empathy and sensitivity on all fronts, this isn't about blame. This is about helping a child and a family um, just be the best they can. One of the things in diagnosis that we talk a lot about is, as I mentioned, prevention. So, you know, September 9th, 9-9 every year. So it's 9-9 because it's the nine months you're not supposed to drink when you're pregnant. It's a big awareness day. And so I often engage the medical students or public health students to do some FASD awareness. Because as I said, as much as I enjoy taking care of patients, I do think we should think about prevention. So a really important take home message for all of you is this message of no safe amount, no safe time, no safe type um, of alcohol while you're pregnant. So just, you know, just kind of keeping that mantra that, as I said earlier, it's not like the first week versus the last week are okay. There's no, it's not like a shot is okay. And it's not like beer is worse or less than wine or um, hard whiskey. It's really just no safe amount, no safe time. <coughs> Excuse me, no safe type. <coughs> Excuse me, hold that close. So making a diagnosis. Um, it's important to think about what we do in my practice. We use something called the four-digit code, and we use these assessment domains. So as I said, we have to get that history of exposure. Sometimes we don't have it. Sometimes we can't confirm it. I had a mom a number of years ago that actually hired like a private investigator to go back to Kazakhstan to find out if she could find someone who knew the mom of our youngster. And it was interesting. I mean, I don't know that she had to go to those lengths, but she was able to confirm that people saw mom drinking, but she really wanted to know. So we do look at that. And if we don't have or we can't get exposure history, we work around it. We look at brain. The CNS is the central nervous system. So we looked at how the child's functioning. Sometimes we'll look at x-rays or MRIs of the brain to see what the structure is. If you think about that picture I showed you, we spent a lot of time looking at growth, current growth and history of growth. And then we talk a lot about the dysmorphic facial features. And I'm going to show you about that. I think that's my next slide here. So these are some of the physical effects where you see fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, you can sort of see in here, as I said, you're going to have weight or growth deficiency. Sometimes you'll hear a mom say that the baby was small in her uterine growth retardation. So it might be before the baby's born or postnatally. I've had a lot of babies who come out really, really small and they have a hard time um, gaining weight. I have a number of toddlers with me right now that um, had the FAS and um, one of them had to get a gastrostomy tube, a feeding tube, because he was just not growing. So they also sometimes can have abnormal brain structures. Their heads can be small. Um, and so they can have a small head and, a, um, and the inside brain structures can be abnormal. And then you gotta think about these facial features. So what we're pointing out here is short, the opening of the eyes is short, so it's small. Then you have a smooth filtrum, which is that face right here above your lip. And that's kids with an FAS, it's completely smooth. And then the thin vermilion border is a thin upper lip. So, <coughs> so those are pretty characteristic facial features that one often sees. You can imagine I'm a, I'm a bowl of fun when I'm out, I'm always looking at, I love, I love taking care of kids with uh, genetic syndrome. So I'm always like looking at those like, hmm, it's really funny. Um, but um, I, you know, we're, we're trained to look for a lot of these things and sometimes they're just natural. However, it's very rare to see a child, I mean, it's kind of like definitional 
to see um, a child with FAS, this sort of smooth philtrum and that thin upper lip are very important. Um, you'll see things like a low nasal bridge, their noses can be upturned, um, their jaws can kind of be pushed back, um, and they can have like little folds here in the creases of their eyes and have ears like this extra line in their ears. And again, small head, which we see pretty characteristically. And so I think that one thing that I, I often say is thinking outside of the box, because in medicine, sometimes folks, you know, I mean, sometimes people, we can all have something about us that's just a little bit different than the rest of the population. It doesn't mean that you have a genetic syndrome or an FASD. But I think it's about looking outside the box and thinking and seeing things for what they are, um, but also being willing to be open and put pieces together and recognize that it may sometimes not be an FASD and that's okay, but it's the most important thing is that you're just trying to dot all your eyes and really think a little bit about um, the child and the family and how you can help them. And maybe you're not gonna have an answer right away, but it could evolve. So let's talk for a minute about the child's behavior. Um, that um, NDPAE that we talked about is, again, you have to confirm that alcohol and um, it's an emerging diagnosis and it describes um, an impairment of neurocognition, self-regulation and adaptive function. Um, it doesn't usually require the presence of the physical features that I just shared with you. And so when we think about those neurodevelopmental um, behavioral effects, we have to think about the lower IQ or developmental delay, some of those executive functioning deficits. So it's like telling you know Johnny, hey, go to your locker, take your books, go to homeroom. Can't do it. Um, impaired learning. You'll hear parents say a lot that they spend a lot of time going over math, and then like the next day, just all out. It's like Groundhog Day. Um, visual, spatial, and math are big challenges for kids with an FASD. Um, motor functioning delays for younger children. You hear he was clumsy, he didn't walk, couldn't get up the stairs, falls a lot more on the playground than other kids. Here are a lot of challenges of self-regulation. Cranky babies, difficult to soothe, colic, um, moody as they get older, um, can have a lot of outbursts. The big thing is attention, shifting attention and poor impulse control. A lot of times they can be at risk for you know, drinking, getting into trouble, because those are the kids that can easily be swayed by peer pressure. Um, they're also at high risk for predators because they'll believe someone, very concrete thinking. So someone comes up and says, hey, your mom told me to come pick you up, or hey, why don't you let, come with me to my house? I can help you make a lot of money. Very trusting um, and really you know, not suspicious. So at very high risk for being um, you know, taken advantage of. The difficulty learning and adaptive skills, um, those communication skills are you know, very concrete thinkers. If you've ever read the book, Amelia Bedelia, um, it's a story about um, a housekeeper who is very a literal thinker. And so it's meant to be funny, but if you think about how she sort of thinks, they'll say things like, you know, um, dress the chicken, you know, or as a, the task, and then the chicken comes out and she literally put clothes on it. So thinking about kids with an FASD, you know, they might, they might not understand things like some of the phrases we use, like, you know, the grass is always greener on the other side of the street. They might be going to the other side of the street and say, what are you talking about? So some of those like, you know, analogies, metaphors, Often social skills, they can be a little bit awkward, very trusting, like um, parents will often tell me that like they just, kids will sometimes shun them. I know my little guy who was 20, I was talking to his mom and he was just really, really into ballet and this like great dancer when he was in high school and the kids just were relentless and just picked on him and he just really didn't get it. And he would still try to go sit with them in the cafeteria when he was in high school. So that, that social skills and kind of the EQ part is challenging. Uh, many live with self-care or daily living skills issues. And again, I mentioned those motor skills. One thing that I really did want to talk to you about um, with uh, the last couple of slides here is just the role of the medical home. Um, I believe that the, you know, looking at that screening, providing that patient family-centered care, the care integration, and kind of thinking about that referral is important. You know, documenting the care plan, documenting all the things that I mentioned tonight are really important for kids with an FASD because they often need therapies and a lot of specialists to coordinate um, to get to that pathway for the diagnosis. I wanted you to have the toolkit. I'm on the Champions Task Force with American Academy of Pediatrics, but this is a great website to go to. There's a lot of information on diagnostic approaches and flow diagrams, so it's something that you want more of. It's in your handout. 
There's an article that's also in the chat that um, not just because I'm a part of it, but we really wrote this very intentional on that role of the medical home and the role of support, because that's often what I think, I'm not smarter than anybody else. It's really my team. And what I find for parents of children with an FASD, it's about navigating school. Sometimes I'll tell you that sometimes the diagnosis, we come up with these very long reports, we integrate them. My team is myself, a neuropsychologist, a geneticist, a nurse, a social worker, a physical therapist, occupational therapist, speech therapist, there's a lot of us. And sometimes I'll pull in genetics or psychiatry if we need them, but we write a very long report for all of our diagnoses. And while it takes time and it's integrated, I often feel like for the family, they're often there because they're worried about an FASD. So while the diagnosis can be challenging, sometimes what's even harder is navigating. And so we made a conscious decision in our program to not just give the diagnosis and say goodbye. We try to provide this medical home because we find that then getting the IEP at school, working with the families, getting into specialists, getting insurance, that's the, the tough part. So that care integration is huge. And so we often talk about referrals and getting into those various specialists and thinking about who else might need to support that family in that referral process. And so what I would say is just like Kermit, to remember to partner with families and across the medical home and the behavioral health sector, education and community. These are all areas that are key and important for what we do and um, for children with an FASD. And so I think this idea of team-based care and interprofessional care, you know, this common goal, the interdependence. So I'm collaborating with behavioral health, I'm collaborating with the family, I'm collaborating with the school. Today I was with a family um, that happened to have an FASD and one of my community health workers and a parent advocate had, were all part of the IEP for this guy at the meeting. Really makes a difference. Um, this is a really great, I think a CDC can, handout if you guys thought, you know, it talks about one in 20 children may have an FNAC and kind of highlights a lot of the things I talked about. I like the graphic if it's something you're looking for. If you're looking for a handout or something that you're going to and you're like, hey, I want to encapsulate what Turchi said in a, in a brief, um, you know, snapshot. This is right here. It kind of walks through, um, <clears throat> you know, as you think about it here um, that, um, people with an FASD can have those physical issues that I showed you with the face and the heart and the brain, there's behavioral and intellectual disabilities, um, communication issues. That, um, and then really what I said at the very beginning, it's lifelong. So school issues, sometimes it might be hard to be on your own, mental health issues, sometimes at risk for substance abuse, keeping a job, and at times, you know, trouble with the law. And I think one of the things that gets the attention of, of um, money um, or policymakers is that drinking while pregnant can cost the U.S. $5.5 billion. So just kind of think about some of those things. Um, I wanted you to have these resources from the various organizations that I mentioned tonight. You can go to their websites and their um, resources are on there. And my key take home messages are really this. FASD are more common than we many thought. You probably either know or have or will meet a child with an FASD. Thinking about that history and screening um, is important, should be routine for all patients, for all families. Um, behavioral issues are variable. They, want, they need referral, they need intervention, they need support in the medical home, along with all the medical issues um, that a family may be challenged with. And the big thing again is that FAC is 100% preventable. And remember what I talked about, no safe amount, no safe type, no safe time to drink while pregnant. So the key is that we all just have to work together and try to help children and families um, and just, you know, really support them in, in all that they need and all that they um, can accomplish. But navigating the system can be really intimidating. So that's the end for me. Um, I can uh, stop my screen share, I guess, or there you go. Um, and I hope that um, I'm happy to take any questions at this point. Dr. Turgy, this was so, so hugely helpful. I was, I took myself off camera because I was having some uh, connection issues, and but my head was nodding the entire time uh, because so much of what you said just really hit, 
hit the mark, I think, for, for many of our families um, and really valuable information. Uh, while uh, we get ready for our question section, Lisa is going to put in the chat our evaluation. Um, and so those of you who might need to, to leave, um, if not right at seven, a little before seven, um, please do take just a moment to fill out that evaluation. It's hugely helpful to us in knowing what our families need, um, want, what they liked about this, what um, could be um, new topics for us. Uh, we had some feedback from last week's session about uh, need for more basics. And so we asked Dr. Turchi, and she did a great job of sort of covering that, some of those um, questions at the beginning of her presentation. So we really do use that evaluation feedback. So please, please um, take a moment, fill out that evaluation for us. Lisa, I think you have been doing a good job of uh, taking, we have getting wonderful amounts of questions, keep them coming, chat them into the, the questions pod. And Lisa, do you want to go ahead and um, work on that? Sure. I will ask the first question that I have. Uh, Dr. Turchi, a lot of the diagnoses require that there be confirmed prenatal alcohol exposure. How can we get the right diagnosis when the biological mother is in another country and is inaccessible so we cannot confirm whether or not she drank during pregnancy? That's a great question. And I will tell you, um, we have a, about three or four years ago, we looked at our program and it was over half of the kids that we saw in fetal alcohol spectrum disorder clinic, we didn't have confirmed alcohol. So your question is spot on. And um, we often ask it because as I said, it's one of our core four, but the way our, our pro, you know, and I, and, I, and different people, we use something called the four digit code. Um, there's, you know, some people will make a diagnosis um, without kind of using, and I'm not criticizing, I'm just saying what our clinic does. We use, we kind of go through this algorithm, it's sort of an evidence-based algorithm of how we go and all of our folks are trained on it. Many times, for all the reasons you pointed out, we don't have it. So our approach is that we also, we can't make up the information, but usually in those scenarios, there's a high index of suspicion. We are able to make the diagnosis without it. We talk, we, we will, we will put the caveat that we haven't 100% confirmed the alcohol exposure, but that everything is consistent with a diagnosis of FASD. And so we will we will go out there on that limb. Sometimes, you know, again, it is we can't make up the medical information, but um, we do we you know we'll, they say things like high index of suspicion while not witnessed. Um, you know, and again, it's important to also protect you know and be sensitive to the biologic mom. But you certainly, depending on the criteria and how you approach it, you can make that diagnosis. We make every effort we can without being, you know, overly, as my daughter might say, getting up in people's grills, right? Or with that phrase is, you know, where it's like you'd be really obtrusive and sometimes it's very sensitive to contact biologic parents or to your point, you know, we have a lot of families that come to us from Eastern Europe and so it's just hard and inaccessible. So sometimes you just don't know, but we, but we go with it and we're able to make that caveat. It's a great question, though. And a follow-up to that question, you mentioned um, the sensitivity of information regarding the biological family. How would a foster or adoptive family uh, seek assistance in making an actual or a potential diagnosis? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, sometimes what we've had is you know, depending, I've had um, wonderful experiences with adoptive agencies if we're seeking, um, you know, connecting with biologic parents because sometimes you need that consent. And a lot of times what we do and others do is that we don't, it's not, it's not so much, I mean, absolutely a diagnosis helps. We all know that sometimes getting a diagnosis can be a gateway to services. Sometimes it just helps get that extra physical therapy or maybe it helps the school give a child what they need. Um, if we focus on the need and we talk a lot as a foster parent, you know, because sometimes you do need consent to come, we focus a lot on what the outcome is, is that sometimes even for children who might not come out with a full-blown FASD diagnosis, we are, our assessments are not, you have it or you don't. It's here's what we're seeing and here's some recommendations based on school functioning, at-home functioning. I mean, I had a child that had an FASD high, and we weren't able to confirm alcohol, but it was pretty, pretty classic, and um, it was a highly likelihood diagnosis. 
But for his mom, it was like homework. She would talk about how it was just that three to five, she used to call it the witching hour. And we often see this with kids with an FASD that like they are so wound up at school to keep things together that when they come home, it's like everything unravels. And a lot of times for foster parents, that can be so challenging. So we'll often talk about those kinds of things and work with foster parents sometimes in having, we'll do whether if it's sensitive and then maybe it's not an opportunity where everyone can be on a conference call together or a meeting, we'll do it individually and we'll offer to kind of talk to that biologic mom with permission. Sometimes Department of Human Services or the foster agency, you know, can help broker some consent issues. But um, we see that a lot where foster parents are getting a child and they're the ones that are starting to put pieces together. Sometimes it's also, we've seen a number of times where it might be the third or fourth foster home because some of these kids are going from home to home because some of their behavioral issues are so magnified. Or they're, you know, I had a little girl who was kicked out of, pre, out of a preschool, you know, and, um, and it was, a, and her, this foster mom had other children and she couldn't, she had, a, she couldn't, she was not gonna able to keep the child because she had other, she just couldn't get she a number of foster children. And so some of these sequelae, you know, we were able, she was, I mean, she was sad, but she almost had to give the child back and we were able to work with the preschool and get some behavioral supports in there. So I think it's key with foster parents to get to that diagnosis, to figure out, is the barrier Department of Human Services, is it the bio parents won't sign consent? But I think really, you know, we've done a number of kind of pre-meetings with foster parents to kind of talk about what is their biggest concern. Um, many foster parents come to us from connecting to other foster parents or doing reading, and we try to help them navigate how to get to that diagnosis because they, it, sometimes it's a game changer just in, in behavioral strategies. Thank you for that answer. Uh, next question, can you please clarify the percentage of diagnosed children with FASD with facial, facial features? Uh, the person asking the question has an understanding that there's only a very small number of days of exposure to alcohol when the facial features are developing and up to 90% of people diagnosed with FASD don't have those facial features. You're correct. So overall, when we say FASD, I mean, kind of the number that most of us use for the overall big umbrella of FASD is about one in 20. Um, FAS is a much, much smaller percentage. The, the problem is, you know, I mean, we're talking, you know, I mean, it's um, like, like less than 1%. Um, but I think because, as I mentioned earlier, you know, um, in some, in some, and, and, and I should caveat this to say that in some of the studies that have been done, FAS is higher because of um, some of the cultural influences of alcohol. You're 100% right. The, the folks that have the facial features, the classic, the way I was trained years ago is a much smaller percentage of the umbrella. Um, and that's really where lies the challenge because it used to be the training was that you had to look for the face. If you didn't have the face, you didn't even think about FAS. And that's where the spectrum comes into play. So yes, you're 100% right that the vast majority of children will um, be on the spectrum. They're not gonna have the classic face. Sometimes they'll have you know, some growth issues. They might have like slightly smaller head. They might not have grown so well, but if you, that I, I use the photo that um, I do because I think it's pretty dramatic. It sticks in people's heads. Um, but you're, you're absolutely right that the overall, when you think of that broad umbrella, fetal alcohol syndrome is, um, it's, you know, overall of all the spectrum, it's definitely less than 10% um, of, of, of all the kids on the spectrum. Um, I think it's the easier group. I have, um, I have a, a couple of, I have a, a patient right now um, whose mom is really unfortunate. Um, we had confirmed um, alcohol exposure because his foster mom was actually taking um, his sibling while his mom was pregnant with him. His foster mom was taking his um, half sibling to visit and she saw mom drink. And he has like every facial, I mean, he's like a textbook, unfortunate case. Um, not only does he have a thin lip, but he had some kids with really full blown FAS have, you know, cleft lip and palates and pretty significant deformities. But you're right that um, it's a smaller percentage. And, you know, from a diagnostic standpoint, it's, you know, you always look for it. I've also had a number of kids who have not had um, any of the classic FAS features. I've had a handful 
who met the criteria for an FASD but also had other diagnoses. And that's the important thing to know. It's not, you know, sometimes FASD occurs in the context of other things. So while they might not have the classic FAS features, they could have another genetic syndrome and still have an FASD. But yes, you're right that the take-home features you should not focus on if there's, you know, if there's not the facial stigmata. I, I always rule that out first and rule out whether there's other facial, you know, other genetic syndromes you might be, um, you know, uh, worried about because I have seen that a handful of times. But yes, FASD is where it's at, which is why I think we've, um, we've missed so many in our time, so. Great, thank you, uh, Dr. Churchy. We are at, actually we're a little over time, so I, we have a number of questions and I don't wanna uh, dismiss any of the questions, but uh, you do have Dr. Churchy's contact information. I'm gonna ask you to wrap up, Dr. Churchy, because we have a number of questions that really talk to sort of, who do we go to for diagnosis? Is it a pediatrician? Uh, where do we start? Um, what about all these other diagnoses that we're getting? And, you know, maybe pediatricians are a little more comfortable giving some of those di other diagnoses, uh, but we really feel as FASD. Can you just give some guidance, um, sort of what's the what's the next step if we have, if we as a family member has a really strong suspicion um, and we're not really getting the answers from our run of the mill providers? It's a great question. I always think the first thing to do, if you have, if it's a littler guy, less than five, the first thing to do is to get connected to early intervention. Get get that is just a key thing to get in place. They're not necessarily going to get you a diagnosis, but I have I don't know that I've seen many children who have not benefited from speech therapy, physical therapy, occupational therapy. So almost all kids with an FASD need one or some of or all of those. So get get them get them plugged in so you can get that kind of cooking in the oven. You're right to get because you can get those just based on delay. So I always think about what's the path of least resistance that's going to help the child get an early intervention, or if it's in school, you know, start getting, start thinking about opening up that IEP, get an IEP meeting going. Um, there aren't a lot of FASD clinics, and you don't need to necessarily come to one like mine to get a diagnosis. I'd say that you know the places many times geneticists will see these kids, but they tend to focus more on the syndrome. Um, you know, they I think. We often say refer to genetics if you start to see, whether it's the lip and the things I described. Um, developmental pediatricians often can. Um, and there are, that's one of the reasons why I shared that toolkit. You know, general pediatricians, while they might not feel comfortable making that full-blown diagnosis, I would say going to your medical home, your PCP is a place to start. And really thinking about and saying to your PCP, hey, I heard this crazy pediatrician from Philly talk about this thing called FASD. I think that Johnny might have it. You know, what do you think? And you know, share my article. Um, there's other resources. Hey, look at this AP toolkit. If you look at that AP toolkit, and that's why I like to share that, there's this great, two great sort of things in there. It kind of shows this algorithm slide. And I've had a number of parents that have come to me with resources, and I love it. You know, sometimes parents and caregivers, when I have kids with rare syndromes, they come in and they know a heck of a lot more about a random deletion than I may have never seen it. But together, we work on the feeding tubes, and I can manage other things. Any, in my opinion, any pediatrician worth their salt, if they're a true medical home, is going to partner with you and say, hey, I may not know a lot about FNASD, and maybe I can't make the diagnosis. Um, you can also always reach out to myself or other people that are really passionate about this, because depending on where you live, no fast too. You know, a lot of the people that are in the advocacy space know kind of pockets of people that families can get to that say, you know what I mean? But I, but I think that, you know, think about early intervention. Think about getting in development and thinking about going to that medical home and being really straightforward that this is the high index of specificity of what you think you might have. Those are my questions. That's great. And again, we do have some other questions and I don't want to discount them. So uh, uh, Dr. Churchy has her shared her email. We are also here to help at Forum Families Forward, especially if you're local and maybe you're feeling um, like you're not getting the services that you uh, your child needs. Uh, do contact us. We're glad to set up a consultation. And I'm putting in the chat that we have a web page with lots of FASD resources. Dr. Churchy mentioned um, NOFAS, uh, and there's lots and lots of organizations and, or, and um, resources out there. Last week we heard from FACETS. So, you know, definitely check out that resource web page if you are um, not, not having your needs met immediately. Um, there may be some resources there that can, can um, be helpful. We have found that our friends to the north, the Canadians have done a 
much better job uh, than some of our our uh, our states in, in the United States to, to do some of that early diagnosis work and and create resources that are really helpful for schools and for family members. So so um, we have some of those Canadian resources up there as well. Any last words, Dr. Turchi, before we say good night to everyone? I would just say thanks for having me here. It was really a pleasure. And I think that organizations like yours in this community are um, keep up the, the advocacy. They're wonderful. If there's anything I could ever do for anyone, please don't hesitate to reach out. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be part of this tonight. So thank you. Happy New Year. Uh, we so, so appreciate um, uh, your guidance and um, hugely helpful information. So everyone have a safe, <laughs> safe and uh, good evening. And uh, we will see you hopefully next week for our next webinar focused on educational interventions. Take care. Thank you.